knitting chart can be used to knit a color work pattern or texture pattern. In some cases, it can do both. In today's Technique Tuesday video, I'll explain the basics of chart reading using color work charts and basic knit purl patterns. As always, if you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, there are direct links down in the description. Before we do that, I'm going to mention something that you likely already know, but I want it to be in your mind as we discuss reading knitting charts. And that is that when you knit, you can either knit flat back and forth in rows, or you can knit in the round like this with the right side always facing you because when you knit flat, sometimes the right side is facing you and sometimes the wrong side is facing you. So when I knit in the round, the right side is always facing me and if I want to knit in stockinette, I knit every stitch every single round because the right side is always facing me and when I uh, want stockinette fabric, that's what I have to do to get this result. At the beginning of the round, I start with stitch number one and because I have 64 stitches in this round, I am going to end with stitch 64 and then I start the next round again I start at stitch number one and I work across to the left starting from the right working all the way across around the left keep going keep going until I get to stitch 64 when I work stockinette flat I do different things when the right side is facing me than I do when I the wrong side is facing me First of all, on a right side row, I start at the right edge and I start with stitch number one. And in this case, I have 10 stitches, so I'd work all the way across till I got to the left edge where I worked stitch number 10. And I would be knitting all of these stitches. And then when I turn the work to the back, the wrong side is facing me and I start at the left edge. Now this looks like the right with respect to the side facing me, but it's the left edge of the public side of the work. This is where stitch number 10 is. I'm going to work in reverse order from stitch number 10 to stitch number one. And in order to get knit stitches on the front of the fabric, I have to work these as pearls. So I'm doing different things in order to produce the same fabric. Now the other thing about knitted fabric, regardless of whether you're knitting flat or in the round, is that after you work the cast on edge and you work row one, then row two, then row three, etc., the cast on edge is hanging below the needle and it gets further and further away from you. The row that is closest to where you are working is the most recently worked row. So it's the row with the highest number. So this is a piece of stranded color work. And you can see what I have here is this motif right here that just repeats over and over again as it's worked in the round. I have other motifs um, that separate this motif, but, but this, is, this is the motif right here. And I was working in the round, the right side was always facing me. Here's the chart that I used in order to knit that motif. And, and there's a number of pieces of information. Uh, first of all, you'll see that um, there's, it says MC, which means main color, and CC, which means contrast color. A chart that's a color chart might say, uh, if there are multiple colors, might have CC1, CC2, CC3, or it might just tell you uh, the colors, or it might not say anything at all. It might just expect you to know that you can use whatever color you want where the squares are white, and you can use a different contrasting color wherever you see something that's black. It could be any of those. The next thing you can see is that I have the column numbers are numbered. Sometimes you'll see that in a chart, other times you won't. I tend to like numbers, so when I make a chart, I do put those numbers in there. And sometimes you'll see them on top, sometimes you'll see them in both places. It kind of depends on how big the chart is. Then you have the row numbers or the round numbers starting at the bottom and going to the top. So when you read a chart like this, you're going to start at the bottom of the chart because as I was showing you, when you look at your knitting, the first thing that the first row that you knit is at the bottom of what's hanging down from your needle. And when you are working in the round, you're always working from the right 
to the left. So you're always working in this direction. So the, the row numbers or round numbers appear on the right edge of the chart. This motif is really contained. It doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see how that plays out in a piece of knitting. So for this repeat, it's a multiple of 10 stitches. So you'd have 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, whatever um, stitches in the round. But this is one where it's not self-contained. It's not, uh, you can't visualize as well what is going to happen in this situation. So sometimes charts are presented like this, where you can see the context of the repeat, which has got a border around it, within the context of the entire fabric. So you have a better idea of what this is going to look like when you work the repeat. And then you can see in the final fabric, that's indeed what it looks like. And this is what charts are meant to do. They're meant to represent what the finished work is going to look like. So here's another chart that uses color work. I've got this in progress right here. It's a little tree and it's not a repeating motif. It's a standalone motif. So you could repeat this, but it's not meant to be worked in stranded color work. It's meant to be worked in intarsia. So in this type of color work, this is meant to be worked flat. And so what you'll see is that we do have numbers on the right side, right edge of the chart, but we also have numbers on the left edge. Because when we knit flat, we start on the right side rows, we start at the right edge and we work across to the left edge. And then when we get to a wrong side row, we work from the left edge back across, but instead of knitting, we're purling. So that's the second thing to keep in mind is that we have indicators here of different colors to work in this chart, but you'll see that these are meant to be work in white, but you'll also see that this square is indicating that on the right side, squares that are sort of blank like this or just filled in with a color are meant to be worked as knit stitches. And when you work on the wrong side, they're meant to be worked as purl stitches. When you look at the context of the entire chart, you can see, oh, this is meant to be worked in stockinette. I understand how to work stockinette. I understand that when I'm on the wrong side of the work, I'm purling the stitches rather than knitting them. This is a chart that creates a texture pattern that looks like this. What we have here is that we have this border which indicates the repeat and then we have stitches that come before that border and stitches that come after that border. Then you can see that we have row numbers on the right edge for the odd rows. Those are the right side rows that start at this from this direction. And then we have the even rows, uh, our wrong side rows that are worked in that direction. And what you'll see is that, again, the blank boxes are knit on the right side and purled on the wrong side but the dots represent pearls on the right side and knits on the wrong side. And this is where some knitters get a little confused and they want to know why does one symbol have to represent two different actions? Why can't a box that is blank mean that you always knit it, whether it's the right side of the work or the wrong side of the work? Well, again, remember, this is representing what the finished work is going to look like. So if we look at this, you can see that this is the repeat and I've, I've added a few more coming this way. And that represents what this looks like. So with all of the, the repeats kind of filled out here. This is what that chart would look like if every box represented what you actually did, whether you were working in a right side row or wrong side row. A chart is meant to provide context to what you're knitting, not only telling you what to work in any particular stitch on a given row, but also tell you how was that stitch worked relative to how the stitch below it was worked. So when you are ready to work a stitch pattern like this, you look at it in an overall context, and then you know how to work the next rows. So in this first row, I'm working the first two stitches and then I start working what's in the box, which is another knit two. So I've worked a knit four and then I've worked purl two and then I do a knit two and I come back and that's another knit two. So really what I'm working all the way across is knit four, purl two, knit four, purl two until the very end. So I'm starting and ending with a knit four. Well, what happens for the next three rows? For those three rows, however the stitches present to me, whether they present as a knit stitch 
or a purl stitch, whether it's on the right side of the work or the wrong side, however it presents to me, that's how I work it. So I don't have to refer to the chart. I know that once I've worked this row, I just work the other three rows based on how the stitches look to me when I'm looking at them on the needle. Then when I get to row number five, that's when I have to pay a little more attention. Okay, well this row is going, this is a right side row because I have the number at the right edge. I'm going to work a purl stitch and then I'm going to work two knits, four purls, two knits, four purls. So I'm alternating two knits with four, uh, four purls instead and then I have this odd purl stitch at the start and the end. But what else is happening? Well, the column of two purl stitches is becoming a column of four purl stitches and the columns of four knit stitches become columns of two knit stitches. So you can look at it in that way too. So you're not looking individually at each box without paying attention to what the other boxes are doing. You're looking at it, you're using the previous uh, rows to help inform you of how to work the present row. The idea here was that the texture that was created by right side knits would, would, be, would appear in full at the beginning and the end of the column. But if you were working that in the round, you wouldn't need these extra stitches. You would just need the multiple of six stitches. You'd only need what was in the borders. And so in that case, you could work the chart in this way. And you'd always work from right to left all the way across that way. Now this isn't always true. Sometimes there's an extra stitch or two that, that does something to balance the stitch pattern regardless of whether it's knit flat or in the round. Um, but in most cases, when you see a stitch pattern that is presented as for knitting flat and these, and you can see that these are there to create symmetry, you can look to see if this pattern is just, can just be worked with what's in the boundaries when you are working in the round. So I want to give you a couple of tips for how you can keep track of what row you're on when you're working a chart. Now this chart is printed out pretty big. Often charts are quite a bit smaller, but there are a few different things that I have used and there's probably more. But one thing that you can do is you can use your just regular old post-it notes. So let's say I was about to work uh, row five. I would place my the sticky part of my post-it note on row six above row five because I want to be able to see what I've already knit and I can compare what I'm knitting to uh, what I've already knit and, and I can compare the chart to my knitting. So I don't want to place it underneath because then I lose the context of what I've already been knitting. The downside of this is that they lose their stickiness after a while and if you shove this into your knitting bag it might get caught on something and it could fall off and then you'd lose your place. An option I really like when I'm working with a hard copy of my chart is highlighter tape. So some yarn shops carry this, uh, uh, so not all of them do, um, but it's the same idea. You highlight the row that you are working on and this lies flush with the paper so it's not going to peel off. When you want to move it, it, it pulls off just like a post-it and then you can move it up to the next row and stick it down again. Uh, but it, it tends to stay sticky longer than a post-it note does and because there's no edges flapping off to catch, it's, it's safe in your knitting bag if you're, if you're moving it around. You don't have to worry about that. A third option when you're using a hard copy chart is a magnetic board. So it's sort of like a, a metal clipboard and you have these little strip magnets and the magnets, and usually these things, if they're sold in knitting shops, come with a number of different magnets. So some of the magnets will just hold it to the metal board, and then some of the magnets can be used to uh, mark what row you're on. And again, you'd, you'd lay it on the row above the row that you're currently working on and so that you can have the context of what is below the needles. The final thing is not, is when you are not working from a hard copy but instead are working from an app. So there are uh, there are uh, apps for mobile devices for tablets and phones 
phone would be far too tiny for me to look at. These apps on the tablets, often what you do is you upload you the PDFs that are associated with your pattern and you are able to highlight particular row numbers as you are working. So a lot of people use those. It's not something I use because I don't use a tablet. I'm more likely because I will also create my own charts is just have it on my computer in front of me and I'll just highlight whatever row I'm on myself manually without the aid of a, any particular app. Today I showed you how to read charts for color work and for simple knit purl patterns. I showed you how to read the charts when knitting flat or in the round and how to look at the stitches in the context of the entire chart. In the following weeks, we'll explore more complex patterns that incorporate a variety of stitches, such as those used in lace and cable patterns. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.